These two tank models were the most numerous in French service in 1940. Despite their large numbers, these vehicles were largely ineffective at stopping the German invasion of 1940. And while these tanks have a number of technical deficiencies, the primary reason for their lack of effectiveness was due to French tactics, strategy, and organization. Hello and welcome to Tank and AFV News. My name is Tom and this is yet another episode of the Tanks of World War II video series. Now in this series, each episode we look at a different tank that was used in World War II, give a little bit about the history of it, technical description, and then an evaluation of you know what exactly uh, did this tank accomplish? Was it very good? So this is episode seven and we are going in chronological order. So starting in 1939, hopefully working all our way all the way up to 1945 eventually. Um, we're still fairly early in the series. We are in the German invasion of France of 1940. And we have already looked at the French FT, which is the old World War I veteran, the light tank that stayed in service all the way up until 1940, although in a somewhat limited role. Then in the second episode, we looked at actually three tanks. We looked at the uh, the Char D1 and D2, and we looked at the FCM 36. Now those tanks were all um, attempts at coming up with a replacement for the FT, which again had been in service in significant numbers since uh, the end of World War I. This episode we're going to be looking at two more tanks that were also attempts at coming up with a FT replacement, and these are the ones that actually um, succeeded and were built in large numbers, and this is the Renault R35 and the Hotchkiss H35. Then we'll also be looking at sort of the improved versions of those two vehicles, uh, the R40 and the H39. By the early 1930s, the French Army saw the need for a new requirement for a simple infantry support light tank. Now this new tank was to be small with only a two-man crew, armor of about 30 millimeters thick, and armed with two machine guns or a small caliber gun, Maximum weight of six tons, but an average speed of eight to 10 kilometers per hour or so. So that was the initial requirement. And if these specs seem really sort of like an improved FT light tank, that's pretty much all they wanted. Uh, basically the French wanted something no bigger than the old FT and not much faster. Because uh, this was intended to be an infantry support tank. Uh, it didn't need to go much faster than the men that were accompanying it walking along. But they did want a little better firepower and a little more armor than the FT. Plus, frankly, the FTs were all worn out and obsolete by that point. Now, this vehicle was not intended to operate independently. So again, high speed was not all that important, nor was anti-tank capability seen as a necessity when the original requirement was put out. Now, in many ways, one has to understand some of the larger issues facing France in the 1930s to understand the requirements for this particular tank. French doctrine was still largely based on their experience from the First World War, and that had been a war of attrition and of numbers. Uh, so they also still believed in the sort of notion advocated by General Estienne that he had when he created the French FT light tank in the First World War, which was a sort of a, a bee swarm of tanks, that uh, you know a limited number of larger tanks would be f too vulnerable to enemy anti-tank weapons, so therefore it's preferable to have a large number of smaller vehicles sort of flooding the battlefield. Um, that was sort of the theory that when he created the FT and it sort of s still was in vogue. And like I said, World War I had been a war of attrition um, and that experience weighed heavily on French thinking. Uh, so quali quality of tanks was considered secondary to quantity, um, especially in a post-World War I era where France had suffered from uh, political instability, financial crisis, limited defense budgets, and manpower shortages, um, particularly these manpower shortages in the late 30s. And this was due to, um, since they had lost so many young men in the First World War, uh, a greater proportion um, than any other country in that, in that conflict, 20 years later, by the late 30s, all of a sudden there's a real manpower shortage in young men because all those men who did not come home during World War I never got married, never had children, 20 years later, you see the results, um, a lack of, of young recruits for the French army of that period. So the thinking is a two-man tank, a small two-man tank, takes two men, whereas a larger vehicle, it takes three or four, well, you're gonna be able to have fewer tanks because you have fewer crew member. So that sort of thinking in terms of quantity really weighed heavily on French thought, plus just the fact that um, having limited uh, 
defense budgets and limited industrial resources, smaller tanks, easier to build. So, of course, cost being a big concern in that period, um, it led to some odd decisions, such as to recycle the old 37 millimeter guns off the old FTs, which is the SA-18 gun, um, despite the fact that they're really anemic armor penetration capabilities and not particularly good high explosive chucking capabilities. Now, this oversight would be corrected in later versions of these vehicles, uh, the H-39 and R-40, although most of the French infantry tanks used in 1940 would still be equipped with the old, fairly obsolete SA-18 gun. By 1933, the French army had put out a request for this new light tank design and got responses from 14 companies and government agencies. Two of those are Renault and Hotchkiss, which are both fairly significant uh, companies in France at that time. And they both submitted designs. The Renault was uh, known as the ZM prototype, Hotchkiss submitted a turretless design. They actually started designing that before the requirement was even put out. They um, had sort of heard about it through unofficial channels and got a little head start, but their design got rejected um, in, in, in favor for the Renault design. And so the Renault one won um, and got the official name of Char Leger Model 1935, although commonly referred to it just as the Renault R35. Now, the French Army recognized that there were a number of issues with the R-35 in its early version, including problems with the suspension, but they decided to push on with the production in view of gathering war clouds over Europe. Uh, testing also uncovered issues with the quality of the armor on the tank, which was of cast construction. Now, tests in 1937 using French 25 millimeter anti-tank guns revealed that the armor of the R-35 had significant irregularities in it um, compared to regular armor plate, and this was fixed, according to sources I've said, in later production models, but uh, it's probably fair to assume that the, the French castings were not quite as effective given their thickness compared to uh, some of the comparable tanks used by other nations at that time. The turret of the R-35 was designed by the government workshop APX, and it was called the APX-R turret. Makes sense. Now this was a cast turret armed with a machine gun and a 37 millimeter cannon, and it fit one crewman, so the commander was the gunner and the loader. Now this turret would also be adopted by Hotchkiss for their vehicle when they redesigned their turretless prototype to accommodate a turret. The suspension issues of the R-35 would later be corrected by a new suspension system designed by AMX. Now this variant would become known as eventually as the R-40. Now the R-40 also featured the newer SA-38, which was like the old SA-18, it's a 37 millimeter gun, but it's quite a bit longer barrel, so it had better armor penetration capability. So we see with the R-35 a fairly straightforward development. It gets adopted, initial versions produced, later on improvements, then the war starts. The Hotchkiss tank has a much stranger history in some regards. Uh, Hotchkiss had modified it to accept the same turret as the R-35, and end up with a vehicle that was pretty similar characteristics to the R-35, yet it had been rejected by the French infantry and for good reason. They had found that due to an inferior gearbox, it was harder to drive and control and slower. So it's very strange that considering that, that the Hotchkiss H-35 somehow got adopted by the French cavalry. Um, you would think that the cavalry would want a faster tank, but that um, for some reason didn't happen. French Minister of War Jean Fabry had seen a demonstration of the H-35 and he had come to this conclusion that it would be a better vehicle for the French cavalry than the Somois S-35. Now this was not a popular decision with the French cavalry, um, but regardless they were forced to accept um, initially about 200 of these H-35 tanks from a production order starting in 1935. Now in the 1937-1940 period uh, saw a sharp increase in French army spending and arms production and it was decided that neither Renault or FCM, who was making the FCM 36 infantry tank, um, had enough production capacity to reach the new goal, which was for 2,500 total infantry tanks. Therefore, the H-35 was authorized for production as an infantry tank as well. So it ended up being both an infantry tank and a cavalry tank, which is sort of odd. You would think that you'd want different requirements and characteristics for those vehicles, but I guess the French are a little different. Now that. H-35 proved unpopular with both the infantry and the cavalry. Hotchkiss undertook an effort to improve the vehicle, which resulted in the H-39 tank. 
Now this model featured a more powerful engine, improved road wheels, a slightly wider track, and a more powerful 37 millimeter gun. The SA38 is the model type. Now the H39 was produced both from uh, newly constructed vehicles at the factory or by upgrading existing H35 tanks. By the time of the German invasion in 1940, a total of roughly 1,200 Hotchkiss tanks of both types had been built. Total numbers for the Renault R35 uh, was 1,540, with an additional 145 R40 tanks produced. At a glance, these two vehicles look very similar, and in fact, in a lot of ways they are. Uh, starting with the turret, they both use the same turret, the APXR. Um, so let's take a look at that thing. It's a small one-man turret, much like other French turret designs. It's of cast construction rather than riveted or welded. It has a vision cupola on top of the turret, although there's no hatch on the top. So there's no way for the commander to peek out of the top of the vehicle as you would expect in most cupola designs or most tanks of that period. Visibility for the commander is not good. Um, well, it's probably safe to say that that holds true for a lot of early war tanks. Um, and the commander has to sit on a sort of fabric sling that didn't really have a proper seat. Um, and it's hard to imagine, if you've seen the inside of one of these things, um, how he's supposed to keep track of what's happening on the battlefield if he has to constantly be moving around, trying to view things through either the gun sight or the various division devices that are mounted um, in the cupola or the turret itself. And, you know, if, if you don't believe me, I would suggest go over and I'll put a link to uh, Nicholas Moran of World of Tanks, aka the Chieftain, did a video where he actually examined an R35. And, his observations are illuminating and entertaining. Now, if the commander does want to see from the outside of the vehicle, he does have a hatch that's on the back of the turret and it folds down almost like a seat. And so he can kind of stick most of his body outside of the tank and sit there. Um, but then he's got his entire torso exposed. So you know, not in a very uh, practical fighting uh, position, and, you know, unless the guy's got a death wish or something. So that's the description of the turret and some of the problems inherent with it. Um, now the turret is armed with the Rebel machine gun and the SA-18 37 millimeter gun, which as we said earlier, it's recycled from the old FT light tanks. They wanted to save money, so they just literally pulled the guns out of those things and put them in these new tanks. Now, the Rebel, the machine gun, this was the vehicle and fortress version of the French FM 24-29 light machine gun, which was a pretty decent gun for the period. Well, it had this very kind of uh, ammo drum that sat on the side of the thing instead of on top like you'd imagine. So not as good as, as belt-fed belt guns tend to work better in armored vehicles, but um, never really read anything terrible about the Rebel. Now, that cannot be said of the SA-18 gun. As I've said, this was not a good gun for the period. It has very limited anti-armor capability. And you know, as far as high explosive, it's a 37 millimeter round. It it's just really doesn't have that much punch to it. Now, as we said, later on, the improved SA-38 37 millimeter gun would be introduced. So at least the later H-39 and the R-40 had some armor piercing capability, although even that gun was not spectacular, even by the standards of 37 millimeter guns of that period. And now moving on to the hull of these vehicles. Uh, the hulls of the R35 and S35 are obviously they're different, but similar in layout and appearance. Both are about the same size, small, <laughs> with a single crewman inside the hull, the driver. And he's sitting in the front of the vehicle slightly off center. Um, in the R35, he's a little off center to the left. Um, and the H35 is a little off center to the right. Now, at first glance, it can be hard to tell these two vehicles apart, um, but there are a couple visual clues you can use to distinguish them. Uh, one is the rear engine deck. On the R35, it runs straight across to the back of the vehicle, um, while the rear deck of the H35 slopes downward. So if, sort of in profile, if it slopes, it's a Hotchkiss. Also, the H35 has six road wheels mounted in three uh, identical bogies. The R35 has only five road wheels, um, four of which are in two bogies, and then the fifth, which is the front road wheel, is sort of in a half, half of a bogey. Um, and that's right behind the front drive sprocket. Both vehicles have drive sprockets in the front. As to mobility, the R35 was equipped with a Renault uh, V4 gasoline engine, pumping out 82 horsepower with a top speed of 12 miles, miles an hour. 
The suspension consisted of sort of a scissor type bogey design um, with what are described as rubber springs. Um, and I haven't been able to find a lot of information, detailed information on those springs because rubber just seems like an odd choice, but that's what they say. Now the H35 had a six cylinder Hotchkiss gasoline engine providing 78 horsepower. Top speed on that one was said to be 17 miles an hour, although as we said earlier, inferior gearbox compared to the R35 meant that the speed was rarely obtained in practice. And the driving characteristics of the vehicle were really quite poor, which was one of the reasons the French infantry rejected the design. Now the suspension of the H35, um, it's visually similar to that on the R35, although it uses a metal coil spring set horizontally um, in the bogey scissors. Both vehicles, the hulls are constructed of castings rather than what being riveted or welded, which is the norm in most countries at that point. Um, and it gives the vehicles a somewhat rounded and smooth appearance. Both vehicles offered a maximum armor thickness of about 40 millimeters. Um, although, like we said earlier, the French castings did not always result in armor of similar quality to rolled homogenous armor plate used in some of the other tanks of other nations. That said, 40 millimeter was still a pretty decent level of protection by the standards of 1940. And it's really one of the few good features on these vehicles is the amount of uh, armor thickness they had for the weight and the size. Radios were not standard in either of these vehicles, although later they were introduced in the upgraded H39 and R40. Uh, that said, you have to wonder how effective a radio would be in these tanks when you've got one man in the turret, the commander, and he's already busy trying to load, aim, and fire the main gun while commanding the tank. So imagining him also having to fiddle with a radio, this guy's got a lot to do. As we stated earlier, there are two important variants of the H35 and the R35, and that's the H39 and the R40, the improved versions of these vehicles. In the case of the Hotchkiss, uh, they introduced the better 37 millimeter gun and then also a 120 horsepower engine, which did actually increase the mobility quite a bit. They also corrected some of those poor driving characteristics of the earlier version, as well as uh, some improvements to the suspension, swapping out the older style rubber wheels, road wheels for steel ones, and slightly widening the tracks. Uh, radio sets were included in some of these vehicles, as well as episcopes for better visibility. Now, technically, the French considered this a variant of the H35 and not a new tank model. So the official name is Charles Leger Model 1935H Modifié 1939. So quite a mouthful. Although most people just call it an H39. So in a lot of the literature, it's almost treated like a separate tank. The French considered it just an upgrade of the existing one. Now the R35 also saw significant improvements in what is commonly called the R40. Now, just like we saw with the Hotchkiss, technically, the French did not consider this a brand new tank. It was an improved variant, and it was called the Char Leger Model 1935R Modifié 1939, but we call it the R40. Like the H39, this variant saw the introduction of the improved 37mm gun, radios, um, kept the same engine, but had a brand new suspension. Uh, this suspension was completely different than the previous design on the R35, and it consisted of small 12-rolled wheels in six bogies um, and supported by vertically mounted coil springs. It kind of looks more like the system on the old Char D series. The Renault R35 was considered, of course, an infantry tank, so therefore they were generally found in the BCCs, Battalions de Chars de Combat. These were essentially independent tank battalions, meaning they were not permanently part of a large organization like a division, but were rather attached uh, to various infantry divisions to act as support. Each BCC fielded 45 tanks. These were organized into three companies. Each company had four troops. Each troop had three tanks. So that means each company, uh, if you do the math, that's 12 tanks and those different troops, plus they got one more command tank. So 13 tanks per company. And you also had a support company of five tanks and a command tank. So if we do the math, 13, 13, 13, so that's 39 plus those other six, so 45 tanks. Uh, aside from the tanks, the BCC also had about 100 other vehicles of various types, including supply tractors, light off-road command vehicles, recovery half tracks, and other stuff. With the H-35, unit organization gets a little trickier since that tank was used as both an infantry tank and a cavalry tank. As an infantry tank, it was organized and fielded in the same manner as the R-35, so just like the BCCs. 
as a cavalry tank, things get a little bit more complicated. Since the French were reshuffling their armored cavalry units a bit in that time period, um, upgrading to certain models of, of tanks and whatnot. So the French army preferred the Somwa S-35 as their primary tank in the cavalry role, but production delays of that vehicle had forced them to accept the H-35 and H-39 um, into service. Uh, now, these were used in the light mechanized divisions, known as DLMs, or Division Légère Mécaniques. Now, despite having light in the title, these are actually the closest things that the French have to proper armored divisions, and they're equipped with, you know, like I said, the, the, the S-35 is one of their larger, more powerful tanks of the period. The French also had a number of light cavalry divisions, referred to as DLC, Divisions Légères de Cavalerie, which also made use of the Hotchkiss tank. Now, the DLC were part horse, part motorized units, so they still actually had cavalry as part of them. There were also units referred to as armored divisions in French service. These are known as DCR, Divisions Cuirassier de Reserve. But these were actually part of the infantry. Uh, these units also used Hotchkiss tanks as well, and this was in the infantry support role. Both the R-35 and the H-35 would actually see uh, a little bit of combat use before the German invasion of France in 1940. In the case of the R-35, um, a little under 100 of these had been purchased by Poland before the war, so they saw service in the Polish army during the German invasion in 1939, and a number of these uh, ended up in Romanian hands at the end of the war. Some of the Polish troops, once they realized the war was essentially over, um, sort of took refuge in Romania, and the Romanian government promptly took possession of those tanks. With the H-35, some would see combat in Norway. So in April of 1940, about 15 of these tanks were sent to the Norwegian city of Narvik. 12 of them would be withdrawn to the UK on June 8th, where they would form the basis of one of the very first Free French armored units. And that unit would actually go on um, to fight in the Middle East, in Syria of all places. Now, being the most numerous tanks in French service, the R-35 and H-35 obviously saw a ton of combat in France in 1940 during that seven weeks. And, you know, descriptions of actions involving H-35 and R-35 tanks during the Battle of France are really too numerous to describe in detail. Um, there are some accounts out there, um, and there are instances of these tanks, despite, you know, sort of their less than mediocre gun and slow speed, there are accounts of them being successful in battle. Uh, but overall, not really. I mean, French armored forces were much less effective than their German counterparts, and we know that because France lost, um, and the German armored forces were a big reason why France lost. Now, following the German victory, uh, they captured a good many usable R-35 and H-35 tanks, and they pressed them into service in all sorts of secondary roles, uh, particularly using them as training or for security purposes. Later on, they'd also modify some of them into uh, Panzerjäger, which I'll get into in later episodes when we get to, to that topic. Now, Vichy France would also retain some of these Fran uh, tanks, using them in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, even there's at least one account I found that said uh, Vichy French H-39 tanks destroyed four American Stuarts during the opening stages of Operation Torch. Now, following the war, some of these old French tanks would also show up in the Middle East. So in the 1948 war uh, between the Israelis and their Arab neighbors, a handful of H-39 tanks would show up um, in Israeli hands, sort of through clandestine measures. They, they got some of these, and that formed the, the genesis of what would become the, the, the armored force of the, the IDF. And then also uh, the Syrians managed to get their hands on some R-35 tanks, which they used against the Israelis in 1948. So, that's about the last that I know of, of combat use of these vehicles. And like I say, by 1948, these are really probably gonna be quite worn out and obsolete. Now we have gotten to the evaluation part of the video. This is where, with my vast knowledge and insight, I declare whether these tanks were good, bad, indifferent. And with this one, I'm gonna give it sort of a thumbs down. Uh, the, the Renault and the Ochkis, these are the most common tanks in French service, and they've got such a bad gun. I mean, the, the, the SA-18, that short barrel 37 millimeter gun, recycled from World War I, almost no, ar very poor armor-piercing capability. It means that the, 
most common tanks in French service can't really engage German tanks very effectively. Um, I mean, at close ranges. Now, on the flip side, you, you can say the same about some of the German tanks. The Panzer I and II aren't going to be able to do much against these vehicles with their 40 millimeter frontal armor. But they've got other characteristics that make them useful for the type of war the Germans want to fight. On the flip side, these French tanks, yes, they've got some armor, they're slow, they don't have radios, the crew's overworked, they don't have good firepower, they're not very useful vehicles for countering the type of war the Germans are going to fight. So they did not serve the French very well in that regard. Um, and of course, the French didn't know at that time, we have the luxury of hindsight, so we can look and say that. Um, the designs probably made sense, though, for what the French requirements of the time were. Now, with that said, we can't just blame sort of the technical uh, merits or disadvantages of this design for why it wasn't successful. A lot of it was how they were deployed and used. Um, and when you look through the literature, you'll see the, fray, the, the term penny packets tossed around a lot, that the French had their tanks deployed in all these little penny packets where the Germans had theirs concentrated. And in fact, the, the famous quote to the extent that, like, you know, the French said, you know, we, we had our tanks in a thousand packets of three, whereas the Germans had theirs in three packets of a thousand. Uh, obviously, that's a gross simplification, but it does express the notion that the German army was much more successful in concentrating their tank forces and using them in mass against the French. Uh, that said, tank deployment tactics were not the only or even the main reason that France fell in seven weeks. The primary reason is the flawed overall strategy of the Allied forces, which failed to recognize and react to the German strategy in a timely manner. Now, when you talk about French tanks of 1940, you'll see a lot of sources try to claim that the French tanks were better than the German ones. And usually they use the examples of the S-35 and the Char B-1 bis. Um, and these were, by 1940 standards, pretty impressive vehicles. But they were not used in numbers nearly as, uh, as great as the R-35 and the H-35. So it's a little unfair to say, you know, the French tanks are better when most of them, like I said, are these really rather unimpressive little two-man infantry tanks. Um, and they really represented sort of a dead end in tank design. In fact, the idea of a small, cheap infantry support tank, um, it's an idea that really outlived its usefulness, although we'll see it pop up from time to time again later in the war. Uh, and as, we, as the war progresses, we'll just see that the whole notion of infantry and cavalry tanks really becomes outdated, and that the trend will be toward a single tank design that can do all the different tasks needed. Um, so, you know, for example, General Montgomery would refer to this as a universal tank design. Um, now, the U.S. and the Soviet Union would come much closer to this concept um, than the French or the British would, um, with the M4 medium and the T-34, and the British would finally achieve it in the post-World War period with their Centurion design, but that's really getting far ahead of our story, because we're talking about 1940 French tanks. So, you know, they are a fascinating topic. Um, French doctrine is unique. Um, and it resulted in this menagerie of different designs. So it's, it's, a little, it's, it's interesting that this French campaign, which is all of seven weeks, so in the shorter campaign segments of this series, and yet it's going to be more episodes than probably any other campaign because there's so many different tanks in service. Um, next week, we're probably going to switch away from French tanks for a little while. We still have some left to do. But I want to um, maybe go look at the German Panzer III and... Um, maybe then after that the Panzer IV, and then maybe some of the British ones, and then we'll get back to the French designs just to kind of get a little variety, because I know we've done three French tanks in a row. So anyway, hope you have enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you would like, of course, um, you can subscribe. You can support us on Patreon if you really feel the need. And um, thank you for watching, and stick around, because we'll have our book recommendations coming up next. All right, well, you've made it to the sources and book recommendations part of the video. Um, as with a lot of these uh, 1940 French tanks, there's not a ton of sources and books out there, but um, there are a few, so we will start with the oldest source that we use, and that's from the old AFV Profile Weapons series. Um, this is from the 19... These were published in the 19... I think late 60s and early 70s. Anyway, um, for the H-35 and R-35, you need to look at two separate issues. There's uh, issue number 36 and issue number 59. These are both by Major James uh, Bingham of the Royal Tank Regiment, who I, I really know nothing about, and uh, so I can't speak as to him as an author. Um, but uh, these are nice little overviews of French tank development in that period. Um, 
the, the issue number 36 covers the H-35 and the other uh, cavalry tanks. Um, issue 59 covers some of the French infantry tanks. There's one other issue that covers the rest of the French infantry tanks, but um, that one wasn't uh, relevant to this particular uh, episode, so I didn't post it. Next up is uh, much more recent. This one's from just a few years ago. Uh, French Tanks of World War II, Volumes 1 and 2. This is the new Vanguard series from Osprey and by Stephen Zaloga. Um, of course, Zaloga is probably uh, a name familiar to most of you if you read about tanks. Um, and he's probably the the best and one of the few uh, people writing in English about French tanks of this period. So um, if you're looking for sort of more up-to-date material, this is probably your best bet. Uh, also, then, there's the Track Story series. Now, this uh, number four deals specifically with the Renault R35 and R40. Um, and this is a French publication, but fortunately, this particular issue um, includes both English and French language text. Um, so that's nice, because a lot of this French uh, stuff's obviously only published in French. So um, quite a bit of good in-depth information on the R35 in this one. Also kind of handy if you're trying to learn French and you're looking for you know something that you can... Um, practice on this is probably going to be more interesting reading than some other random french english uh, thing you find and then lastly we have the encyclopedia of french tanks and armored vehicles uh francois beauvillier this one is um, primarily um uh, illustrations i mean it has text describing the things uh, but it's a gorgeous book um, and it's pretty comprehensive of french armor of this period so that is the last book in our recommendation here. So uh, thank you for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.